good morning, everyone, and welcome to Parkwood this morning. Whether you're here worshiping with us in person, welcome. And for anyone worshiping with us at home, welcome. We have two announcements this morning. Um, the first is that there is a virtual fellowship hour today. So the virtual fellowship hour happens at the last Sunday of the month, and today is that day. And it will be today at 11.45. And hopefully you all have the link. If not, you can always email our pastor, James Hurd, and he will send you the link to that. So that's today. Um, the second announcement uh, has to do with the strawberries that will be uh, served after church today by our wonderful fellowship team who are always trying to uh, feed us and uh, fellowship with us. So this morning, um, after the church service downstairs, there will be strawberries for all of us. And this, we, you know, is the wonderful season of strawberries. And we hope that you will all join us downstairs today for that. Okay, that is the announcements for today. James has another announcement. We are profoundly thankful to God for the life and witness and service of Floyd McPhee, who was the pastor here from 1980 until the year 2001. As Minister Emeritus, Floyd McPhee has continued to be held in deep respect, much love, and it is with sadness amongst us, but with rejoicing for him that we note that the Lord has called him to higher service this past Thursday. The memorial service will be here, God willing, on Saturday at 10 o'clock, and we will uh, endeavor to live stream that service for the benefit of those who are not able to gather. There will be a reception which we can express to his family, our sympathy, immediately following the service in our fellowship hall. And thereafter, uh, those who wish to join the family will be proceeding to the Admonston Cemetery uh, near Renfrew for the interment at 2.30. Let us worship. Let us pause for a moment of quiet remembrance. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The Lord watches over you. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. He will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Let us praise him.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we bless you this day for the opportunity to gather in spirit, some in person, but all in spirit, to worship you. You are the God of life. You are the God who triumphs over death. You are the God who is constantly and forever faithful. We acknowledge our days numbered according to your infinite wisdom before any of them come to be. We acknowledge your sovereign mercy in coming to us as a people who are prone to wander, indeed stubborn and self-occupied, all of us. Sinners deserving not of your love, deserving not of your mercy, but wonderfully, inexplicably, recipients of your goodness, your grace, your forgiveness. We counted, O oh God, an inexpressible joy to call you. Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you call us of your love to be your adopted family. You choose to share life with us, life abundant, life eternal, life that is full of richness, life that is full of diversity, life that is life-giving as we share with one another in community. We ask this day that you would receive the praises of your people, Receive them, O God, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, in whose name we gather, in whose name we sing, in whose name we pray, and in whose name we wait to hear your word to us. Accept what we offer you. Let none of us depart this hour and advance into the day that is to come and the week and the mercy of time that remains for us. Except you accompany us by your spirit, with your word, and clothed in your power to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the things that I sometimes wonder about is what would happen if somebody had a video camera and they put it on me with both 
the capacity to observe and the capacity to record any sounds that I might make while I'm sleeping. Now, I don't want that to happen. And I can assure you that I have absolutely no interest in seeing or hearing what might happen in any of your lives when you are sleeping. But I thought about that as I was thinking about what we're going to be doing this morning as we reflect on the Bible's passages together. Specifically, if you noticed in the words to our call to worship, it says, the Lord does not slumber nor sleep. And what that means is that when we sleep, and when we're awake, God is always listening and watching. I find that tremendously overwhelming for two reasons. One, if I don't sleep at night, then I fall asleep in the daytime. I have to get some sleep, and I know that you have to get some sleep. All of us have to get some sleep. Even when I was a young boy and I looked forward to summer, and I knew that I could be outside for all the hours that I would have otherwise had to be in school, I could play with my friends, I could go camping, I could go hiking, I could just hang out. The last thing I wanted was to have to come in for supper and go to bed. I would want to make every hour, every minute of every day count. But I knew that I would fall asleep at night. I would be zonked. I would be out of it. Because sleep is what gives us energy. It renews each of us. Now thinking about the fact that God doesn't sleep is an awesome thought. Because it means he doesn't miss anything. He is able to take in all that is happening. And so when we talk to him, we know that he knows everything. Everything there is to know. Everything about me, everything about you, everything about the problems, everything about the good things, everything everything. And that's the confidence that the psalmist has. And it's the confidence that God wants us to have. So this morning, I simply want us to think about this and to remember, as we go through life, better than a recording video camera, better than one that's keeping track of all the sounds and images of our lives, is one who knows, who knows us, and even though he knows us, still loves us. Loves us enough that he would give Jesus to bring us to him. Let's pray. Gracious God, 
There's so much going on in the world around us. And there's so much going on in our lives. We can't even keep track. But we thank you that you do. And we thank you that you know us and watch us and listen to us. And even and especially because of all you know, you love us. Help us to grasp and to hold on to how great you are. Remind us that we can come to you at any time and you know. In Jesus' name, amen. Can a little child like me thank the Father fittingly? Yes.
Let us pray. For all your gifts, O oh God, we give you thanks for the privilege of sharing as stewards some of those things that you've entrusted to us with others. We also give you thanks and pray now that we might be good stewards. Help us as we dedicate to your service all our offerings. The love of Christ, the truth of the gospel, good news to change the world may be shared with those in our city, across our land, and indeed around the world. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Dale Tuck is going to read for us our scriptures this morning. The Old Testament, the Old Testament reading is taken from Genesis chapter 1, verses 31, through Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. God saw, saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And the New Testament reading is John, chapter 5, verses 16 through 23. Life through the sun. So because Jesus had done these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he's even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son does also. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them, his, his, gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment in the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This is the word of God. Revive your work, O Lord. Let us sing to God's praise before we reflect on the scripture together.
My father is always at work. To this very day, I too am also working. And for this reason, they sought to kill him. Anytime we are confronted with a passage of Scripture or multiple passages of Scripture that seem to show contradictions, we have reason to pay more close attention. And this morning, I have entitled our meditation, The Nature of God, Work and Rest. Now, when we read Genesis chapter 1 and into chapter 2, as Dale did this morning, one of the things that we notice is that at the end of the narrative of the creation of the world, we are told God rested. And when you and I rest, it is often synonymous with sleep. But what is in mind, as this picture suggests, is not the closing of one's eyes and the dismissal of every thought, but more it is the image of someone who has been laboring to create a beautiful garden and now is going to enjoy that garden by plopping himself down in the midst of the garden and taking it all in. And as we approach summer, as we have this week and on this day, many of us long for the opportunity to be free of so-called work responsibilities, certainly indoor and screen-based responsibilities, and to be outdoors in the great, wonderful creation that God enjoys and desires that we enjoy. And if there's one theme of the up-and-coming generations that should give us cause for pause, it is that much of the creation in which we find ourselves is all too easily and all too often spoilt. And the hue and cry that lies in many hearts and gives rise to many voices is that we ought to seek the preservation, the restoration, the health of that creation. Certainly, we look for unspoilt beaches and waters. We look for places where the God-designed, God-given natural beauty of the world can be celebrated. Now, if you've ever planted a garden or worked the soil in some fashion, the joy of being in the midst of that garden as it bears fruit and as the plants give evidence and sign of healthy life is restful. It is renewing because the fruit of labor is there not to be held up on a pedestal, but surrounding us to be enjoyed, to be relished, to be celebrated. And when we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and the first couple of chapter 2, what we have is God relishing 
rejoicing, celebrating all that he has made. And behold, it was very good. Now what we need to do is to be able to translate and apply that not just to the trees and waters and sands and rocks and mountains, but as in this next slide, what you want to recognize is that God's joy in resting remains in the creatures whom he has created in his own image. You and me. Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. And when we are called to observe the Sabbath day of rest, it is not simply for us to sit and rejoice in the beauty of the creation around us. It is that. It is certainly not simply to stop every form of activity and do nothing, as some people, both believers and unbelievers, have falsely understood. But what it is to do is to recognize that the God who enjoys Sabbath, the God who takes rest in his creation, supremely takes rest and rejoices when his people are engaged in heartfelt communal affirmations of praise because we as the creatures of God, first made in his likeness and twice born if the Spirit of God has brought us from spiritual death to spiritual life, are expressing to God the wholeness of our creation and our recreation when we praise him. And so this image of a vast congregation, hands lifted high, hearts on fire with the love and truth of Christ Jesus, give praise to God and are truly celebrating the rest that remains for the people of God. Rest that is our life-giving, renewing energy. Rest that enables us to be in the midst of the greatest of God's creation, the greatest of God's creation are the men and women, boys and girls, who have been made in his image and by the operation of his spirit have been brought back from spiritual death to life in Christ. When we are born anew of the Spirit of God, as John has been telling us in the previous chapters, recounting the very words of Jesus himself, we have life. And it's interesting that the NIV editors use this title, Life Through the Sun, in this particular section. Uh, Dale uh, uh, when he read it, uh, read the editorial insert, which normally we don't do, but it's a, a clean insight into the significance of this particular part of the gospel. To our text, Jesus said to them, My father's always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Now, what he is affirming is that, as the psalmist says in Psalm 121, and as I shared with the children, God never sleeps. 
And the idea that somehow the seventh day is God's day for sleeping is a false understanding of the text, God rested on the seventh day. No, God rested from the labor of creation, but he rejoiced in the fruit of that creation. And what Jesus is saying here is that it is the Sabbath day, and he is in the midst of the people, but what he has done in the preceding passage that we looked at, those of us who were here or connected last Sunday, was that he took a man who for 38 years had been an invalid, unable to walk, and he raised him up and gave his legs strength and gave his spirit voice, and the man entered the temple to praise God. And yes, he was carrying his bed while he was doing so because he had been commanded to stand up and walk, pick up his bed, and go. Life was restored. Health was renewed. Jesus, on the Sabbath day, was bringing life. And the man, whose name we're not given, is rejoicing in the gift of that life. He is praising God in the temple. And after Jesus tells him, leave off sin, he goes out and he tells everyone, it was Jesus who made him well. And the connection between all of that and this is that because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath day, the people, the leaders, persecuted him. They tried the harder to kill him. For he was breaking the Sabbath, but now... He was also affirming that he was connected. Indeed, he was one with the Father. My Father is at his work to this very day, and I too am working. The fact that Jesus identifies himself with the Father is what leads the Jews to be more intense in their consideration that he is blaspheming. He is making himself equal with God. And in the explanation that Jesus gives by way of response from verse 19, he roots himself even more solidly in his union, in his oneness with the Father. I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Remember the prologue to John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Nothing was made that was made except it was made through him. Clearly, Jesus, who took human form after he was born of Mary, pre-existed his human incarnation. He was one with the Father. And when all of the creation was taking place, Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, was there. And in this passage, we're told that he will be there when the final judgment takes place. The Father judges no one, but he has entrusted all judgment to the Son that he may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. God is one. And the manifestation of God in the person of Jesus is to show us the manifestation of the Father. The disciples took some time to comprehend this. They wanted, they asked, 
Show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And they said, don't you understand that having seen me, you've seen the Father, says Jesus. We'll come to that in a later chapter. In the meantime, when we see Jesus celebrating the Sabbath by celebrating and renewing life for his people, and calling his people to celebrate and share life with him, we are in fact keeping the Sabbath. It is not insignificant that the Christian church, from the time of the resurrection, ceased to observe the seventh day as the day of rest, and shifted to the first day of the week, the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. Because if the Father finished the work of creation through the Son on the seventh day, the Father finished the work of redemption on the first day when Jesus was raised from the dead. Life is given through the Son. And life is to be celebrated in the Son, in the Son of God. Now, I ask a couple of questions about how we apply all this. Well, first of all, all of this should give us reason to think, or maybe rethink, how we approach the Lord's Day, the day that is appointed as the Christian Sabbath for our rest and our renewal. It is not simply or principally a day for us to put our feet up and have a nap. Some of us find that a helpful thing to do if we have worked hard all week. And there's nothing wrong with having a nap on the Sabbath day, catching up a bit on rest. But if we think that is our duty, we have fallen very far short. No, the Sabbath day is a day to remember that God rejoices in the beauty of the world around us, which he has made. And we enter into his spirit when we too rejoice in the beauty of the world around us, which God has made and entrusted to us as stewards. It is easier in this climate for those especially who find cold weather to be a problem to be outside in the summer. And it is good for us to rejoice in the beauty of the world around us on the Sabbath day in the summer season. But if we think that having done that, we have truly sanctified the Sabbath, We miss the point. Jesus said, Sabbath is a gift. We are not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a gift. A gift of God to himself. Not a day when he closes his eyes but as a day when he celebrates all that he has done. And if we enter into a spirit of union and communion with God, we too will celebrate the beauty, the completeness, the wonder, the majesty, the beauty of creation. But that's only half. If we've done that, we've only come up to the 50% mark. Because the greater work that is disclosed here is that God in Jesus does something even greater to provide Sabbath rest for the people of God. He gives us life. He forgives our sin and restores us to union with himself, none of which would have happened if Jesus 
had not died on the cross and risen from the dead on the third day. And when Jesus is resurrected, life flows. Life abundant, life everlasting, life eternal. And to celebrate that life, truly from the perspective of God, is for him to enter into the praise of his people, to receive the praises of his people, and to relish those praises. That twice-born men and women, twice-born boys and girls, twice-born creatures after his own likeness, Ascribe to him all praise and honor and glory, majesty, dominion. That is why God chose to redeem us, that we might enjoy life with him. And we affirm he is the source, he is the end of all that life. So if we fail to praise him on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day, we have missed the boat. And if we fail to praise him in concert with others, we have also fallen short. Because God is truly at rest while he not just listens to and observes, but truly by his spirit enters into the praise of his people. Jesus celebrates in the Incarnation, in his humanity, with this one, and with the community to which this unnamed man rejoices as he celebrates the renewal of his life. And this same Jesus enters into and celebrates the life of each and all together who are born of his Spirit. He says there's more rejoicing in heaven over the conversion of one sinner than over 99 who have already been restored and have no need to repent. I wonder sometimes if we fail to capture the significance of what it means to welcome one another into not just the role or the fellowship of the church with the right hand of fellowship, but what it means to welcome one another into the community of faith and to celebrate life together. That is part of what the life of the people of God is all about, and it is part of what gives God joy and cause for celebration. My prayer is that as we reflect upon this great incident, this passage that John relates about the aftermath of the healing of the one who was 38 years lying on his pallet, unable to get into the water, until Jesus said to him, pick up your mat, walk. Let us imagine what it is for some one person to hear the word, Come, come to me, you who are labored and with a heavy burden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Learn of me. I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your soul. Rest and delight in the life that is ours in Christ Jesus. Consider that God is at work and at rest on the Sabbath day. Consider that Jesus is at work and at rest on the Sabbath day. And consider how we, individually and together, are at work and at rest 
on the Sabbath day. And we will find it no burden whatsoever to keep the Sabbath. But as we are told, call the Sabbath a delight. Let us pray. Gracious God, your word is filled with great truth. The life of Jesus is manifest in wonderful ways. By your spirit, help us to take it in. To find in one with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the celebration of the Sabbath day, the Lord's day, the day of rest, the day of work, where that work is worship, and where the worship of your people brings your people and yourself the greatest of joy, our delight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I close the service this morning with our closing praise and hymn, there is one announcement that I neglected to make earlier, and that is on behalf of the fellowship team, if there is anyone who would like to help share in the preparation of the reception for uh, the uh, memorial service on Saturday, uh, that is, anyone wishing to assist either in hosting or providing refreshments and so forth afterward, please call Don Pestalucci or email him as the leader of our fellowship team, uh, if possible today or tomorrow, uh, so that he has some idea of what uh, help he will have for that reception, which is on Saturday uh, after the service. Thank you. Our closing praise, Lord of light, whose name outshines all the stars and suns of space.
One further note of thanksgiving before we close. Steve and Laura Game celebrated 50 years of marriage together this past week. We want to give thanks to God for his faithfulness to them and for their faithfulness to one another. Gracious God, the gifts of life are many and varied. We are grateful indeed for your faithfulness. And we pray that your blessing would rest on Steve and Laura and their family indeed as they celebrate 50 years. Keep us mindful of those who need our intercession. Keep us mindful of those who need a hand, a listening ear, a loving word, a faithful prayer in the days of the week to come. Go with us now, and may our work be a delight, even as our rest is a delight in the God who has finished the work of creation, the work of redemption, but continues at work through the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to this day and evermore. Amen. No.